Hello, my name is Tawny Smith, and I'm one of the members here at Desert Grace. I'm excited to share this Sunday's message with you. Would you take a moment right now to subscribe to our channel? And if you like the video, be sure to give us a thumbs up so that we know you've been blessed. You can do those things below. I don't know if you've ever heard of Cy Wakeman. She is a Forbes contributor. She's also a researcher who looks at conflict in the workplace. I'd never heard of her until I started researching conflict, and then I I started watching a few. uh, She's got some TED Talks, and she's got some videos. She actually has a YouTube show that she does where people write in, and she answers questions, and and all of these other sorts of things. And so she did a workplace study, and she wanted to find out about conflicts in the workplace. And so what she did is she started asking people what the number one source of conflict was in their job. What is the number one source of conflict? And so I left it as a blank there for you so that you can start sort of fill in the blank for yourself. But here's what ultimately almost every person answered. It was other people. My workplace would be perfect if it wasn't for all of the other people who cause issues with what I'm trying to get done, who get in the way of all the work that I have to do. She came to the conclusion that it's not so much about the personality issues and not so much about the people who really just don't know how to do their job. The biggest conflict comes most often from a lack of clarity. It comes when the team doesn't know what they're trying to accomplish. When they don't know what they are supposed to be doing to move the ball where the ball is supposed to go. So whatever your workplace happens to be, if it's sales and you want to sell the most things, oh my goodness, there's goodies flying around out there. And you want to have the... the, I'm sorry, but I just, all of a sudden there's cups and muffins and everything over there. Little, anyway. Lack of clarity. What is it that we're trying to do? If we're trying to sell the most of something, we got to know what our job is in that, in that sales chain or in that productivity chain or in whatever else is going on. The solution, of course, she says, is defined at least in part by setting goals. What are the goals of our particular organization? What are we going to try to do in the next period of time? What what are these things going to to make happen? And, And once we've set goals, we need to make sure that everybody on the team knows what they're supposed to do. Because if everybody on the team knows their role, then there'll be a little less conflict, right? You know? Still people, I know. Finally, there's an issue with procedures. And and the the issue with procedures is that if you don't have any, then you have a problem because people don't know what to do in order to get what they need to have done, done. But if you have really rigid procedures, there's no way for people to be able to do the little flexible things that help you reach the goal because they're too busy trying to fit it into the box of the procedures. And so that's something that that she says, you know, make sure that the procedures aren't so, because otherwise what happens is you get somebody who gets like a $100,000 sale, right? Because they they didn't exactly follow the procedure. I mean, everything was legal and whatever, but, you know, they didn't cross the box or sign or initial here or whatever. And so somebody else is causing a lot of conflict by going, hey, congratulations on the $100,000 sale. Do you realize you missed an initial? No, wouldn't ever happen, right? (laughs) She says clarity will increase or probably will increase your profits. Hmm. Unfortunately, with all the clarity, there will be no more conflict ever anymore in your workplace. Hmm. No, clarity will earn you a little bit more money. We'll get your team all on the same page. But it doesn't necessarily mean that everything's going to be conflict-free. In fact, she tells senior leaders, you should expect to spend 80% of your time resolving other people's issues. Hmm. I've been talking about this for a little bit, and I talked about how all 
of our conflict is rooted in our all-out war against God. That, that, that's where all conflict originates from, is that we originally were in conflict with the very one who created us, and, and that we created a war where we really wanted to sort of have him not be God anymore, let us be God instead. We say we want to be like God. Well, God can't be God and, and we be God all at the same time. One of the main sources of conflict in our lives is pride, and so we can be really kind of caught up in our own egos and in a sort of conceited pride. And so we talked a little bit about there is such thing as healthy pride. And healthy pride, a lot of times, is the pride that we get by knowing that we are connected with God. That's a big part of healthy pride. A concern that sometimes gets us into conflict is that we want to be in control. And we do this in a few different ways. One is that we want to control how other people approach us. We want to be those little g gods and goddesses. And other people approach us, and if they approach us the right way, well, then we might give them the time of day. But if they don't do it the way we wanted them to do it, then we won't, right? And then the other thing is, is if they do make an error in talking to us, we want them to come and apologize to us. And sometimes we want people that don't even know that they've offended us to come tell us how sorry they are that they've offended us when they didn't even know they offended us in the first place. Or we take something to the grave because we've been so, so bullheaded and, or, or somebody else dies and we can't ever get the closure that we expected, which is basically them coming and bowing down to us and kissing our feet. That's, that's the reality of it. It's a dysfunctional conflict resolution model. And last week I showed you what I think Jesus' one is. The good news is that God has given us the gift of reconciliation, and we've been talking about that being friendship and harmony, and, and that we can end the war not because of anything we've done, because God has done it, and God has offered it. He then says, look, I want you to be my ambassador, to be someone who's out in the world and doing the things that I need done in the world on my behalf as if you were God because you represent him every time you step out and speak to somebody else. I know, not a big, big deal, no, you know, little of responsibility, right? I think that's why last week it was so incredibly dead quiet in here while I was preaching. <laughs> I even had a hard time getting some amens. My question for us this morning how do we resolve conflict among friends? You see, I know that I haven't necessarily said that it's easy to try to live out a, a, a lifestyle that has less conflict. It's not easy to, to do things like turn the other cheek. That's not something that I think is just, okay, well, this, this is easy. Let's, woo -hoo. The problem is, is we do st still have that sort of healthy pride. And when someone wants to take advantage of us, we want to we end that. Rightfully so. But every so often, a friend comes and the same sort of things occur. And what do we do then? What do we do then? Luke records one friendly disagreement in Acts 15. If you've been in the church for a while, you've probably heard this story. And, and one of the things that gets me about this story, and it's the story of, of Paul and Barnabas and John Mark. One of the things that gets me about this story is that scholars kind of talk about it being uh, maybe a little bit of a bridge. A little, a little bridge story that gets us from the, the council at Jerusalem, which we'll talk about in a minute, all the way over to getting started on the second missionary journeys and how it ends up that they end up in this next place. And so they talk about it being a bridge, but I think there's other ways in the literary sense to get us from point A to point B that doesn't involve an argument between two people who are supposed to be friends. You follow what I'm saying? So here we go. I want you to think about this for a minute. Why would Luke include this in his story? Acts 15, starting at verse 36, going through verse 41. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and to see how they are doing. 
Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it was wise to take him, because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. Cilicia or something like that. I think through that story, and one of my, my first thoughts is, I don't know if I'd have said it that way. I might have tried to find a way to say it more, um, I mean, it was pretty diplomatic, but I might have tried to find a way to say it a little even more diplomatically. Like, oh, yes, yes. And it was decided that Barnabas and John Mark would go one way, and Paul and Silas would go another. I think that's how I would have left that. Because why would we need to bring in this sharp disagreement? I, I don't really like conflict. I don't know if you know that about me. Some people think I like it. I did try to call APS while I was sick. That didn't go well. Still. For a long time, scholars have tried to fill in the blanks. Because Luke tells us these little tiny bits of information. But he doesn't tell us the details. I don't know if you know this about us as people. We like all the little details. We like to know. We, we kind of want to have it sort of, sort of laid out for us so that we know what we're supposed to think, maybe what we're supposed to say, what we're supposed to do. And unfortunately, in the story, there aren't a whole lot of details that we really get. And so here's what I think we need to make sure we're doing. Focusing on what we know right? If we can't go with the facts, because it would have been great if Luke would have said, oh yeah, and this is what happened. First one said this, and then the other said that, right? Then we could go, oh yeah, well, you know, let's take sides. I think sometimes we tend to take sides anyway. We, we, you know, Paul is just such a superhero. Don't know why we do that, but we do. But I want you to remember that Paul and Barnabas were friends and co-workers. First and foremost, you are talking about two guys who were serious about what God was doing in the world through, through the introduction of Christianity, through the introduction of Jesus Christ, and they are so incredibly excited about what's going on that they are devoting their lives, a calling into making sure that people know about Jesus Christ, and specifically Gentile people. We can make sure we have that. Uh, Barnabas had a great name originally. I'm sure you remember it. Go ahead, shout it out. That's right, it was Joseph. I know, it's just a little trivia, but I, I, somebody was going to mess me up and know it. We first learn about Joseph from Acts 4, 36, 37. And it's when the church is really going great and, and they're just getting started and there's all these exciting things and they say there was this field owner named Joseph who came and he sold a field and he laid the money at the feet of the disciples so that there would be more money in the coffers for the church to build its buildings and to do the live streaming and to buy the microphones and all of those sorts of things. Amen. Or to take care of some of the poor that are part of the church. But you, you get what I'm saying, right? So it says this guy named Joseph, and by the way, it says that the apostles called him Barnabas. Joseph, who the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Could you imagine? How many people do you walk around and go, oh, you know what? Here comes the son of encouragement. Yeah, no, you haven't heard it. Yeah, me neither. But, but the, the apostles had a nickname for him and said, look, that guy that is so encouraging that every time he comes around, you just, you're like so excited. 
look, it's Barnabas. He's going to come and he's going to encourage us in some way, right? He, he's the one that, that kind of helps Paul get started. He's the one who, who brings in John Mark into the, into the scene. He's, he's the one who, who sells a field and gives the money to the church so that the poor could be taken care of. He's the one who's done all of these incredible things that are just so encouraging to the Christian faith. We should be a little more excited about Barnabas. We really should. Some things that we know about him is that he was from Cyprus. So that means that he was Jewish, or he was Jewish, and he was from Cyprus, which means that he'd be a Jew of the diaspora. When, when things went bad and everybody took off and, and Jerusalem kind of, all the Jews got scattered, he ends up in Cyprus, and, and, but he comes back to Jerusalem when Jesus, anyway. And so that's who he is. Then we know what we know about Paul, right? He had another name. It was Saul. Yeah. I knew you'd know that one. We remember him from first from the, from the stoning of Stephen, right? You, you remember him from that. Standing there kind of holding the jacket. And scholars kind of go back and forth. Was he really the one that was kind of inciting them to do it? Or was he just sort of, hey, hold my jacket for a minute. Okay. We obviously know he ends up going to try to persecute Christians, so, so that's got to be a problem. And on his way to persecute Christians, he has this incredibly dramatic conversion experience. Now, I don't know about you, but my conversion experience is really quite boring. I was like five years old. I didn't even have time to get into all the bad things other people got into, right? And so I remember so vividly my, I want to be, I want to have Jesus in my life. I mean, I can remember that moment vividly, but I don't remember any bright lights or voices from heaven or blindness where other people needed a vision to come and God had to tell them to come heal me or I would not be able to see ever again. That's pretty boring compared to Paul. I just said, yes, I remember. Jesus, I want you in my life. I remember the moment when he came into my life at five years old. I didn't even have time to be naughty by then. She's not here. Some people. My troublemaker row up here, huh? Of course I was a perfect child. I know that sometimes, honestly, sometimes I know of Christians and, and I've talked to a lot of them and I am one of them sometimes that it's like, you know, it just seems like if I had a more exciting conversion story that it would be easier to share the gospel with other people. I don't know if that's true, but for Paul, it sure seems to have been that he was just really passionate before about getting rid of Christians. And then oh, now he's got the vision, the bright lights, the, the, all those sorts of things, voices from heaven. He'd be pretty convincing. That's all I got to say. Their first assignment together was in Antioch. Find that back in Acts 11. So Paul and Barnabas get together. And in case you wondered how they got together, it was because Barnabas went to, to Tarsus to get Saul and to bring him in. And, and the scripture tells us that they were there together, ministering together for a year. That there was a year that they were part of a ministry together. There was a year that they had worked side by side. And so you have Barnabas, son of encouragement, going to get Saul, the one who was such a problem, and bringing him along and bringing him into ministry, kind of giving him his first job, maybe mentoring him a little bit. And in that part of the, the book of Acts, you always get Barnabas and Paul. Later it'll switch, but it's Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas and Paul. After about a year, the church sent Barnabas and Paul with some help because there was a famine in Jerusalem. You might remember that a prophet came down from Jerusalem and said, hey, a famine's about to come. They got together, they decided what they would do, and they said, look, we're going to send Barnabas and Paul up to Jerusalem with some help for the Jews up, in, up there the, that are going through the famine. So they go back up into Jerusalem. They're up there with the gifts, and they run into John Mark, and they come back with him. 
they were called by the Holy Spirit to preach as missionaries. So they come back, and immediately it's time for them to move on. They're not going to stay in Antioch. They're going to go, and they're going to preach all over the country, right? I mean, that's the whole goal. So what does the church do? Specifically, they say they fasted, they had prayer, they laid on their hands, and they sent them on a very successful mission. There's one part in there that's missing. I think it's just a clerical error on either Luke's part or on some of the translator's part, but I'm sure there was an offering taken. <laughs> Is it church if there's not an offering? <laughs> One of the first stories in the first mission is the story of E the sorcerer. Not really sure how to say his name. Elimas the sorcerer. And basically, he's causing some issues. And Paul basically looks at him and he points at him and says, with the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you are wrong. And the guy goes blind right there. In the midst of all that, Paul had been talking to one of the government officials, one of the governors of that area. And he says, you're messing this up, man. And once Paul blinds the other guy, the government official said, yeah, whatever you're doing is real. <laughs> and converts. Converts. Keep waiting for the Sunday where the Holy Spirit says, point to this person. They'll be blinded. Everybody else will listen to what you have to say. So they will on the mission thing. They are best of friends, I get the impression. Another thing that Paul and Barnabas were was agreed in the doctrines relating to the Gentiles. Now I want to make sure you understand this. The Gentiles were, were still outsiders. They were still kind of unclean. They were still kind of not the best. And, and so Paul and Barnabas kind of going out and talking to them and, and bringing them into the circle was not exactly the best news for some people. You know, uh, there are some churches... I'm not saying that you're a part of any of them and that we are one of them, but there are some churches where change comes really, 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 really hard, even if that change seems to come directly from God. Well, that's what happened with the Jews and bringing in the Gentiles and, you know, when you're so used to hating somebody for so long and now it's time to love them. It's, it's a difficult thing. It's going to bring some conflict, Right. So upon their return to Antioch, they get back from this mission. They realize that hey, there's been some false prophets coming that were teaching that the men in Antioch, the Gentile men, in order to be Christians, needed to be circumcised. That what God had given to Moses needed to happen for these men in order for them to be considered Christians. They're kind of outward sign that they can be part of, of who God is. And so there was a little bit of a debate about that. And rightfully so, right? So they get back, and the next thing we know, there needs to be a council. So who goes up to have the council? Paul and Barnabas. They go up and they talk to the, the council and the council gets together and the council is made up of the apostles and, and some who were Pharisees. You got to have some Pharisees in every good Bible story, all right? And I want to tell you that the Pharisees always do what Pharisees always do. And when you read through the account, don't do it now, I'm preaching, but when you read through the account, you'll see it says the Pharisees were not really good with this idea. But that Peter gets up and gives a sort of stirring speech that, that he says, listen, there are only a few things that really matter. How about this? That the, the new Christian should abstain from food that has been sacrificed to idols because that is not good. They should abstain for, from food that's made solely of, uh, out of blood products of animals. They should be careful about eating meat that has been improperly butchered, in part because some of that could be a ritual sort of unclean sort of thing. And then finally, they should abstain from sexual impurity or immorality. This is good advice, even if you're not a Christian. All right? 
So Peter suggests four things, just four simple things, and none of them involve circumcision. Thank God. Right? By the way, this whole thing, it comes almost directly from the Leviticus Holiness Code. It's more about the Jews than the Gentiles. It's more about the Jews being able to live in, in harmony. In other words, the, the sort of uh, compromise that the, the council comes up with is that, you know what, the Jews are used to a certain sort of thing, being clean or unclean. And so let's kind of put that together for the Gentiles. And in exchange, the Gentiles will not have to be circumcised. That's, that's sort of the, the compromise that they put up. And so they send a letter back, and most likely, Paul and Barnabas were saying, Yippee! Because we've taken away barriers that would otherwise stop some from being a Christ follower. Takes the conditions out, right? Takes the conditions out. So the heart of the conflict that these friends had was not a something, not a doctrine, not a fact that they just didn't ever get along. It was a someone. I want to make sure we get this. Because when you get to the heart of a conflict and you realize that there's a person, a real live, breathing human being, conflict is more likely. Specifically, the conflict that arises is over John Mark. So what do we know about John Mark, right? We know that he had come from Jerusalem to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas when they came back from delivering the, the gifts for the famine. We know that from the scripture that we read. It, it's up there a little bit earlier. We also know that Mark, John Mark left the first mission trip. And that they had begun what they were going to do and when it came time to sail on to the next place, for whatever reason, and we are never told why. It does not say in the scripture that John Mark had run out of money and so he couldn't afford the passage or, or that John Mark had, had become homesick or that John Mark ha had come, come down with the flu or that his car broke down. Or that he just really missed McDonald's hamburgers. Says nothing about why he left. It just says two of them sailed on. John Mark went back to Jerusalem. So we all know why he left. Clear as, clear as day. Because he did. That's all we know. Luke, we wish that Luke would have given us the details, right? If Luke would have told it, because it would have cleared up a whole bunch of stuff. It's one of those little details, like, okay, we need to know why John Mark is no longer with them, because he's not being mentioned or anything else. So, so why can't we kind of clean this up a little bit and, and explain it? Come on, Dr. Luke, let's do this. Maybe, maybe, not sure, maybe Paul kept yelling at him. Maybe, not sure, maybe they always made him carry the load. So that Barnabas was just doing the job of encouraging. Oh, you can make it, John Mark. Come on, keep on coming. You're doing great. Paul was like, hey, hand me another soda pop. I'm thirsty. Maybe. I've warned you guys about my imagination. You keep coming. I did. <laughs> Only thing we could do is use our imagination, but we really wish Luke would have told us. The conversation went like this. It started here, went there, started here, went there. Pretty soon they were upset. He left. But did you notice what I told you about the scripture? And you can go back and look at 1313. 13. It's a little verse. You could do it right now even while I'm preaching. But a little tiny verse. All it says is that Jen Mark went, went on doesn't say John Mark went on because he was angry. John Mark went on because he was sick. John Mark had broken his leg. John Mark had lost his camel. He doesn't say anything. Just says he left. That's all 
what he said? There is a scholarly guess. I'm not convinced that this is what their, the exact thing was, but one scholarly guess is that John Mark might have been uncomfortable with the Gentile mission. Here's why I, I want to tell you about the scholarly guess. I want to believe that whatever it was that caused them to part ways was serious enough that it made Paul so adamant that he couldn't come back. I want to make sure it's something so serious. And to be honest with you, if you are not willing to reach the kind of people that we are called to go and reach, that you are not comfortable with that, that's a good reason for when you come back and say, okay, I'm ready now, for someone to go, ah, remember last time you said, hmm? This conflict arises while planning the second missionary journey. I kind of have a, a, a vision of, uh, of Paul and Barnabas sitting together. Paul starts the conversation off with that sort of, hey, let's go back to all the places we went to, see how everyone's doing. Wouldn't that be fun? You can go back and we can go and we can maybe strengthen them a little bit and help them to reach out and get some more people and, and make sure everything is, all, that could be a lot of fun. And Barnabas goes, that's great. And, you know, we could bring John Mark with us. And Paul goes, huh, no, no. I don't know. I'm not sure how that would work. Barnabas, though, thought that taking John Mark was the right thing to do. He had no doubt in his mind that it was the right thing to do. I don't know if I've told you this yet. I thought I had a note in here, and we may come back to it, but I want to make sure you know, Barnabas and John Mark are cousins. According to Colossians 4.10, they are cousins. Paul thought it was an unhealthy risk for the trip. This is why their disagreement became so sharp. Because Barnabas going here, we need to give my, my cousin, we need to give John Mark a second chance. Things are different now. It's going to be okay. And Paul going, this is too important to mess up. We can't take the chance. Hmm. Thought about all the different resolutions that possibly could have come up. I, I, I'm one of those people that's more of a person of grace and, you know, hey, if you want to bring your cousin or if you want to bring so-and-so, and, -so and I, they deserted us last time, how are we going to keep them from doing it this time? What's the plan? How, how are we going to make sure this happens? And, and if they do take off again, do we just let them go? You know? what, what do we do? How do we know he's serious? but they go a different way. I thought about this. I thought about this good and hard. And when you research this, it's amazing how many people say that they suffered from an attack of pride. I gotta tell you, I started thinking about this months ago, weeks ago. Part of me wants to say they both suffered an attack of pride. And part of me wants to say they were both exactly where God wanted them to be. You see, the problem that I'm having at the moment is, is that if everybody just rolled over and said, okay, I agree, and it was just a matter of which one of us spoke the loudest in the moment, then we might not do what God wants us to do. We might do what I want to do. Or if you're speaking louder and I don't really care, I'm, okay, yeah, let's do that. And we'll pretend like we're happy about it. Right? What do they tell you? Like, in, in we, we have board meetings, right? And, 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 I, and I tell the board, I want you to tell me you're my protection. You're, you're the everything else, right? So don't just say yes. And once we've said yes, you got to support the decision. If you don't agree with it, it's going to be obvious soon. It's a hard position for them to be placed in. 
I wondered which one of them may have felt a little bit out of control, not being approached in the right way, not being able to deal with things quite the way we expected them to be. I wonder which conflict resolution model they might have used or that they were using when they did it. Uh, Do you remember Jesus' conflict resolution model? I know, it was a week ago. I slept too. (laughs) Number one, you release all control. It's not about you. It's about God. Number two, focus on others. It's about others. It's not about you. It's about God. Number three, reflect God's character. Whatever the resolution ought to be, reconciliation in God ought to be in the center of it all. Trying to figure out if Paul and Barnabas, I don't have enough information to know. I just know they had a sharp disagreement and they went their own way. You see, conflict resolution is never easy. I wish it were. I wish it were. But it's especially not easy when we're talking amongst friends. You see, when pride and control get in the way of what we're trying to do, here's the thing. We need to have some healthy conflicts. It would be so boring to live with no healthy conflict. How do we, you guys don't seem convinced. How do we resolve conflict among friends? Here's some ideas I want you to, to kind of think of. Begin with this, some conflict is normal. Not avoidable. Not even necessarily issues of pride. Not even necessarily issues of control. It's just that sometimes you and I are not going to see same, so the same thing the same way and come up with the same conclusion. That's just simply as, as big as it is. You all have a really big decision coming up. Every one of you has to make a very important decision in about 10 minutes. It is such an important decision that you are going to have to find some agreement with somebody and get it figured out. What's for lunch? Here's the thing. Different people are going to have different tastes. I have noticed for a long time that some people, when you say, what are you in the mood to eat for? Some people will never tell you what they're in the mood to eat. What would you like to eat today? Would you, uh, I don't know. How about Mexican? Nope. All right, we narrowed that one out. Or, hey, I'd like to go to Mexican. All right. What restaurant were you thinking of? Taco Bell, no. But the reality is, some of you know this already, I just don't like ham. I just don't like it. If you want to serve me ham, I will eat it. I will be pleasant. When you ask me how it was, I'll let you know how good the potatoes and the green beans and everything else were. And I'll, you know, thank you for the dinner invitation, right? Just, if you serve it up as bacon, I'll really like it. I really like chicken fried steak. And I'm sure there's some of you who go, chicken fried steak, not so much. Ham? Mmm. It's okay, you can be weird. I can be friends with weird people. Right? We just have different tastes. That's all it is. There doesn't need to be a conflict. If you're getting into a fist fight over where to go for lunch, we do offer counseling. (laughs) But if you're just like, I am going to get what I want for lunch, Shame on you. That's just your pride. Sometimes when somebody says, what do you want to have for lunch? Carissa sometimes, she's not here so she can't defend herself. Live stream for a sec. Uh, (laughs) 
Just kidding. They're back there like... Sometimes she suggests we go somewhere for lunch after church that I really don't want to go. I never do that to her, but she sometimes does it to me. (laughs) Really, there are times when we simply don't necessarily have to agree, and it's just a matter of pride. If it's like, oh, yuck, you want to go to that place again? We went there three years ago. Why do we have to go another time? (laughs) Beginning with this premise, a little bit of conflict is normal, helps us to keep our pride in check. Because if there's conflict, by the way, conflict requires two people. One of them, if you are in conflict, is you. You cannot blame this all on other people. One of them is you. And here's the problem. Both of you might be right. In other words, Barnabas was probably right. John Mark needed another chance. He needed an opportunity to go. And, and, and Paul was probably right. That he deserted us once. He doesn't deserve a second chance. This mission is too important for us to take chances. Are those both potentially correct? A little bit of healthy conflict is okay. Both men might have been all right. Second thing I want you to remember is to avoid uniformity as the only resolution. Avoid uniformity as the only resolution. Uniformity is when, when sort of everybody has to come to the exact same conclusion. We need to realize that that's not the only solution to any given problem. Uniformity synonyms, which why I'm telling you is so bad, include things like tedium. Tedious, tedium, uniformity, the Monotony, dullness, drabness, colorlessness, sameness. If these are the adjectives people are using to describe you, you have an issue. <laughs> and a little bit of conflict in your life will keep you from looking like this. Uniformity does not support the idea of having healthy pride. Because it means that anytime anybody comes around, in order to get along, you'll say, okay. Oh, you want to go get some ham? Let's do it. (laughs) Ham is so delicious. I would love some. Yes, thank you. Being uniform, right? Hmm. It's the goal had been a uniform decision, how would both men really ever agree? You hear what I'm saying? You see, one of them would have to to lose and the other one would have to win because they have two different opinions. Uniformity says we have to have the same opinion. And what that means is that one of us has to take an opinion that the other one has, but that we really don't have. We can't do that. Seek unity as the best resolution. Unity is a lot different than uniformity. Unity is a lot different than being the same. Unity is defined as continuity without deviation or change, as in purpose or action. Unity says we have a goal we are trying to meet. Why have we gathered here this morning? We have gathered here in unity for one purpose and one purpose alone, and that is to worship God. We may not have sang a song you liked. You may not have liked the sermon. You may like the sermon. You may not like the temperature of the room. You may like the temperature of the room. You might have liked the videos that we played. You might have disliked the videos we played. You might like the color of the paper that the the stuff is printed on. You may not like the paper. You have all kinds of things, but we've all gathered here together for one reason and one reason alone, to worship God. I don't care if you don't like the color because I frankly don't care what color it is. And that is my honest opinion. It's a tool to help us worship God. I better hurry up. One synonym for unity is harmony. Do you remember that word? Reconciliation, harmony, or friendship? Hmm. Unity 
is all about reconciliation. And of course, we are ambassadors of God. We are ambassadors of reconciliation. We're all about reconciliation. Reconciliation isn't about agreement. I want you to think about this for just a second. When God reconciled with you, did he say, I totally agree with every decision you made that caused us to be not reconciled? That's ridiculous. God said in spite of the fact that you want to be your own God, that you would like to essentially replace me, I still come to you. Can we be friends again? Hmm. Luke doesn't record the conversation. Again, I just wish that he had. He just says that the disagreement was sharp. But what we know is that they tried to continue in unity. Uniformity would be everyone agreeing about John Mark. That wasn't the goal. The mission was the goal. Unity. What are we trying to accomplish? And did you notice that God used the disagreement to use two missionary teams to send two teams out instead of one? Because the important thing wasn't John Mark. The important thing was the mission. And however the conversation went, at some point they said, look, I think God might be in this. I'll go this way. You go that way. We'll cover twice as much ground and we might reach twice as many people. Now, unfortunately, we don't really hear much more about Barnabas and John Mark because the, the focus really turns to Paul and Silas. That doesn't mean that they didn't accomplish anything. Next thing I want you to remember is to honor others in the conflict. Honor others in the conflict. One of the problems that we have as human beings is that when we get into a conflict with somebody else, we start name calling. We start character assassinating and now all of a sudden, it isn't about the conflict, it's about how stupid someone is. About how foolish someone is. Greedy someone is. Whatever someone is. Did you notice, if you've read the Bible through, that all three men are still on speaking terms when they leave? In fact, Paul ultimately is going to speak very highly of both of the other men in his writings. Seriously! Wakeman, the business writer, advocates seeing things from a point of neutrality, which is basically to say that what we ought to be trying to do is, is how can I look at this in a neutral sense? How could whatever conflict that I'm approached with or that people may approach me with, how do I look at it neutrally? Not taking a side, not doing this, but just saying, what is the best thing for this situation? That's, that's her whole thing. But I think success is really ultimately found in a clear unity through goals and understanding roles. I think that it, it ultimately says, what is our goal? Our goal is that people will know Jesus Christ. What is our role? You know this already. What is our role? Ambassadors of God, I finally hear it from a troublemaker. <laughs> Louder next time then. Remember, I'm half deaf. With whom are you united this morning? With whom? Yourself? I hope it's God. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be in this place at this time to worship you united with one purpose in mind. Lord, it's been a good day. It's been a wonderful opportunity. We thank you so much. 
Heavenly Father, help us to remember as we face conflict, help us to remember real quickly that we need to be considering you first, that we need to consider our unity with you and our unity with others as more important than whatever it is that we want. Lord, just help us to remember this as we leave this place, as we go out into this world, that we might be lights shining for you. Not just this afternoon, Lord, but in the days to come, in the weeks to come, in the months to come, and until you come again. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for watching this sermon with me. If you've enjoyed your time with us, we'd invite you to join us in person for a service. Visit us at desertgrace.org or give us a call at 928-305-1132 for more information.